stuff, but uh, thanks for your patience. And so what I was saying is that uh, I had I had the pleasure of um, living amongst uh, a lot of Ute and Navajo people in southwestern Colorado a number of years ago, and I had a lot of experiences that really um, made it clear that Native Americans are still connected to the universal mind in a way that most European and Western people, I don't know what to call us, not necessarily white, you know, but not native. <laughs> the aliens on the planet Earth, right? The non-indigenous people, I guess. Um, and I think we are reconnecting with that, uh, which is which is good. But I'll, I'll just give you guys like one um, really, really... Uh, one really, really, uh, uh, powerful example of something that I experienced before we jump into, I guess this is a talk, um, given at a native American conference that I'm going to react to. I haven't listened to it at all. I don't know, um, exactly what the content is going to be, but I am familiar with the Hopi prophecies and the accuracy of them. Uh, it's actually pretty frightening considering all of the circumstances in the world at the moment. Um, yeah, pretty scary. Uh, but, uh, so, um, just to give an example of my own experience that, that really, uh, you know, showed me, um, that that connection was legitimate. And also, uh, it, it, it made it clear that Native Americans just don't bother to try to tell white people, um, this stuff. Uh, but I was at the peak of my, I guess, awakening, uh, process. I hate to call it that, but for lack of a better term, the Phoenix process, I guess I prefer, um, and there was a very tall uh, Navajo man and a very short, squat uh, Navajo guy walking beside him. Um, and this was on the main street of uh, uh, Durango, Colorado. And the tall one looked like he had just walked off the set of a movie. He had, you know, the turquoise and silver and long black ponytail and, you know, built really well and uh, just um, picture perfect Navajo. Uh, uh, guy and um you know he really just had like an aura of power about him and so i was walking down the street and uh he stopped and he said a white man walking between worlds you don't see that every day and so um i definitely felt like i was indeed walking between worlds at that time and so the short squat one leaned up against the window and he said, this is Night Horse, the most powerful medicine man in the Navajo Nation. And uh, whatever he's about to tell you is very important. And so he showed me how to uh, use tobacco to protect yourself, I guess, would be the easiest way to explain it. And he rolled some Navajo tobacco in a little spliff and um, Navajo tobacco is extremely harsh. If you've had the Mapacho tobacco that we have here in South America, that's really strong, but Navajo tobacco is way stronger and very, very harsh. And he rolled it up and he smoked it in one inhalation all the way down to ash, opened his fingers, the ash disappeared, or the, the, the cigarette was gone, just a little bit of ash. And he controlled his breath and blew a cloud of smoke in each of the four directions. It was the most one of the most astonishing things I've ever seen in my life. And we ended up talking until the sun came up in a parking lot nearby. Um, and after that, you know, I had that experience a lot. Well, while I was in the state, all of a sudden, you know, Navajo people, the Diné, they call themselves in the area, were very friendly and outgoing towards me. And they were, uh, not all of them, some of them actually didn't like it when the elders would invite me to peyote ceremonies or something. Sometimes the younger ones that were with them would say, you know, we don't know why you bother uh, it's, they can't possibly understand and, um, thanks to that effect. Um, and so, you know, I've had a number of other remarkable experiences, both in North and South America with indigenous people. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I actually came out West in the first place because one of the things I was curious was whether or not that sort of native American magic was real and whether they were still connected to it. Um, I know I look like a white guy with blonde hair, but um, I met my grandfather once, uh, only once, and um, there was a picture of a Native American woman hanging above the fireplace, and I asked him who it was, and he said, well, that's your grandmother, but she died of cancer many years ago. Uh, she was Blackfeet, and she was the chief's daughter, and uh, she was um, taken off the reservation and placed in a uh, boarding school 
for Native Americans, uh, and she turned out to be a, a classical piano prodigy, which flew in the face of the um, accepted wisdom that you had to have it in your blood um, in order to be like a prodigy, a natural prodigy. And uh, so according to my grandfather, um, my grandmother was the first Native American woman to play Carnegie Hall. And of course, you know, I'm a lifelong musician. Um, so, you know, I wonder if that wasn't in the blood. Um, so, so yeah, I think there was one other thing that I wanted to, oh, okay. So here's another aspect of this that I feel like I should share before we jump into the video. And that is this, um, there is a famous, uh, fake medicine man called rolling thunder. Um, I'm not talking about that rolling thunder, this rolling thunder that I'm speaking of, uh, died when that guy was probably five years old or something, the fake rolling thunder. So this is a guy that was in his eighties in like 1962. And uh, before the Grateful Dead really got rolling, um, Jerry Garcia, it was in the early, it might have been 1966 or 1967, and uh, Garcia got really, really sick to the extent that everyone was going to worry, or everyone was worried that he was going to die. And so in the middle of this somehow, this medicine man shows up, um, full regalia, carrying an owl, uh, or, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're like wands with feathers, feather wands, uh, all owl and um or maybe it was an owl wing an actual owl wing um either way uh you know something around something along those lines um he showed up to uh tell garcia that he was to be sort of like the shamanic leader of a tribe of rainbow people and that these rainbow people had been prophesied that they would join with the indigenous peoples and when the white man's world was ready to break and collapse um, they would come together and, uh, and, you know, they would create a new earth, um, very much in line with the Hopi prophecy, but it was basically, um, a, you know, prophecy that these hippies basically were going to evolve into something, uh, more along the lines of a rainbow warrior and that they would unite with the indigenous peoples of the earth. Um, and as it turns out, of course, Jerry Garcia did ultimately kind of become the leader of the hippies. And much more importantly than that, I think that the whole psychedelic movement and the consciousness around, you know, that is derived from experiences with plant medicine and whatnot wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the Grateful Dead. I, I don't know. I know people understand that the Grateful Dead were culturally important, but I don't know uh, that as many people understand really the importance, the way that they kept that torch of that psychedelic consciousness in a meaningful way. Um and then carried that through the 80s and 90s when it would have otherwise gone out. Uh, so, I, you know, it's really incredible that uh, Rolling Thunder just appeared at their house to tell them this. Um, and I've heard this story accounted, you know, exactly the same way from at least a half a dozen people that were there uh, in various books and actually in person a few times. Um, so that's pretty amazing. And to his credit, Rolling Thunder apparently healed Garcia of his illness and... Um, he went on to uh, do great things. Oh, Rolling Thunder also told him that it would all end on um, oh, what was the la the date of the last Grateful Dead concert? I think it was July 9th, uh, and uh, that actually came true as well. Um, Bob Weir said that they were all terrified that he meant that year, <laughs> and uh, no, but 30 years later it did end on that day. Um, so, anyways, let's jump into this and see what is what is going on with this prophecy which i apparently
share this message of the prophecies, people say, can't we change it? Could we stop it? The answer is yes. The prophecies... Native people have many prophecies about this time. They say at the beginning of each cycle of time, the Great Spirit comes down through a messenger. He makes a strong appearance upon us. And we are coming to an end of a cycle now. It's not the first cycle. There was a cycle of spirit. There was a cycle of the mineral, the rock. There was a cycle of the plant. And now we're in the cycle of the animal, coming to the end of that and beginning the cycle of the human being. When we get into the cycle of the human being, the highest and greatest powers that we have will be released to us and be released from that light or soul that we carry to the mind. But right now we're coming to the end of the animal cycle when we have investigated ourselves and learned what it is to be like an animal on this earth. And at the beginning of this cycle of time, long ago the Great Spirit came down and he made an appearance. He gathered the peoples of the earth together. They say on an island that is now beneath the water. Clearly a reference to Atlantis, I would say. And he said to the human beings, he said, I'm going to send you to four directions. And over time, I'm going to change you to four colors. But I'm going to give you some teachings and you will call these the original teachings. And when you come back together with each other, you will share these so that you can live and have peace on earth and a great civilization will come about. And he said, during this cycle of time, I'm going to give each of you two stone tablets. And he said, when I give you those stone tablets, don't cast them upon the ground. Because if any of the brothers and sisters of the four directions and the four colors cast their stone tablets on the ground, not only will the human beings have a hard time, but almost the earth itself will die. Didn't Moses cast the stone tablets upon the ground of the Ten Commandments? And so he gave us each a responsibility, and we call that the guardianship. And to the Indian people, the red people, he gave the guardianship of the earth. And we were to learn during this cycle of time the teachings of the earth and the plants that grow from the earth and the foods that you can eat and the herbs that are healing. So that when we came back together with the other brothers and sisters, we could share this knowledge with them. Because something good was to happen on the earth. And to the south, he gave the yellow race of people the guardianship of the wind. And they were to learn about the sky and breathing and how to take that within ourselves for spiritual advancement. More than that, I would say, you know, Asian, Asian people definitely have... Uh the most advanced intellect in general on the planet, certainly the highest IQ is in China. Um, and in the Western occult tradition, the uh, air uh, is, is the intellect. Um, and then also the uh, tools for spiritual advancement, the wind uh, and meditation, we're focusing on the breath in order to uh, achieve that stillness that allows us to become um, like a hollow tube that brings down fire from heaven. And they were to share that with us in this time. And to the west, where there's blackness of night, he gave the black race of people the guardianship of the water. And they were to learn the teachings of the water, which is the chief of the elements. It is the most humble and also the most powerful. And, to and so black people are pretty well known for, you know, having a, a very strong intuitive sense and... Um, have always, you know, like black men, for example, seem much more in touch with the feminine um, than uh, other males of other races. And, uh, of course, you know, the water is um, symbolic of the feminine and the emotions. And even uh, the black color is associated with the mystery and the intuition. Um, and so all of those things are extremely interesting. And that's a, a very poignant attribution um to assign uh, uh dominion over water to the to the black race so so far this is lining up pretty pretty um pretty well with um how i you know my ontology to the north where there's white snow on this continent he gave the white race of people the guardianship of the fire and if you look at the center of many of the things they do you will find the fire in this light bulb they say that is the white man's fire if you look at the center of a car, you will find a spark. If you look at the center of the airplane, the train, you will find the fire. And the fire moves 
also consumes. This is why it was the white brothers and sisters that began to move upon the face of the earth and reunite us as a human family because they had the guardianship of the fire. This was their responsibility. And that is uh, really interesting. I missed that last time around that, um, you know, the white race is generally perceived as having divided everyone, but it is true that we also have, you know, through um, conquests, unfortunately, uh, really united the world and at least in the sense of connectedness um and you know the literal uh connectedness um and you know i would also point out that as guardianships of the fire uh which is the element that comes with the most responsibility i think um we have certainly to an extent failed uh by developing the technology to uh kindle the same energy that lights the stars upon our enemies um and, you know, the, as we will see, this, this Hopi prophecy uh, sounds very much like an indicator of a coming third world war uh, that is to precede um, the uh, final awakening, uh, the transitional point uh, for, for mankind. And so a long time passed, and the Great Spirit gave each of the four races two stone tablets. Ours are kept at the Hopi reservation in Arizona at Four Corners area. I've talked to people from the black race of people. Their stone tablets are at the foot of Mount Kenya. They are kept by the Kikuyu tribe. I once had the honor of presenting a sacred pipe of the Kikuyu tribe carved from the red pipe stone of Mount Kenya. One time I was at an Indian spiritual gathering. A medicine man from South Dakota put a beaded medicine wheel in the middle of a gathering and it had the four colors and the four directions and he asked the people where is this from and they said oh probably montana south dakota maybe saskatchewan he said this is from kenya it was beaded just like ours same colors the stone tablets of the yellow race of people are kept by the tibetans in tibet and the guardians of the traditions of the people of europe are the swiss in Switzerland, they still have the mask uh, day when each family brings out its mask. They still know the colors of their families. They still know their symbols, some of them. Each of these four keepers happen to be people that live in the mountains. If you went straight through the Hopi reservation to the other side of the world, you would come out in Tibet. The Tibetan word for sun is the Hopi word for moon, and the Hopi word for moon is the Tibetan word for sun because they're on the opposite sides of the world. They said that the roads of this land would either go north-south or they would go east-west. If they went north-south, we would come together as brothers and sisters. If they went east-west, there would be destruction and almost the earth itself would have a hard time. So you all know the roads went east-west. They said things then would be lost from the east to the west. They would be lost from the south to the north. But they would come back from the west to the east and come back from the north to the south. So in 1976, from the west to the east coast of this land, from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., people carried a sacred pipe bundle by hand on foot across this land. Because they said if we carried this bundle across the earth, the powers would begin to come back. It was carried from west to east. They said a spiritual fire would be lit in the north, and it would come down the northwest coast of this land. This is it. We have the capacity to start the spiritual fire now here. The old people long ago seen it and foretold it. So we went through the cycle of time. Each of the four races went to their directions and they learned their teachings. And we were given a sacred handshake to show when we came back together as brothers and sisters that we remembered the teachings. It was indicated on the stone tablets that the Hopis had that the first brothers and sisters that would come back to them would come as turtles across the land. They would be human beings but they would come as turtles. So when the time came close, the Hopis built a special village to welcome the turtles that would come across the land, and they got up in the morning and looked out at sunrise, and they seen, they looked out across the desert, and they saw the Spanish coming covered in armor like turtles across the land, so this was them. So they went out to the Spanish man, and they extended their hand, hoping for the handshake, but into the hand, the Spanish man dropped a trinket. And so word spread throughout North America that there was going to be a hard time, that maybe some of the brothers and sisters had forgot the sacredness of all things, 
and all the human beings who are going to suffer for this on the earth. Oh, we'll we'll see this again soon. Uh, a reference to um, these mystery school traditions, but uh, I can think of some other traditions where there's keepers of secret knowledge that rec- recognize each other by a secret handshake. Um, and you know, speaking of secret handshakes and secret societies, Albert Pike wrote in the book Morals and Dogma that um, man at some point in the past had truth and wandering in the darkness he found error and he proceeds to demonstrate that everyone all over the planet throughout time and space at least on earth uh knew the relationship between light and consciousness and stars and consciousness and um it's it's pretty mind-blowing to see that there is this uh Native American tradition of a secret handshake in order to recognize others that had this knowledge of the light. So tribes begin to send people to the mountains to have visions, to try to figure out how they could survive. At that time, there was 100,000 cities in the Mississippi Valley alone called the Mound Civilization. Cities built on great mounds. Those mounds are still there. There was 100,000 cities of Native people. And they were wondering how they could survive, live off the land, because they knew a hard time was going to come. They began to send people to have visions to see how we could survive this time. People came on the East Coast, and we were told in the prophecies that we should try to remind all the people that would come here of the sacredness of all things. And if we could do that, there would be peace on earth. But if we did not do that, when the roads went clear from East to West, And when the other races or colors of the earth had walked clear across this land, if by that time we had not come together as a human family, the Great Spirit would grab the earth with his hand and shake it. And so if you read the treaty negotiations from Red Jacket of the Six Nations on the east coast of this land, clear to Chief Joseph and Chief Seattle on the west coast of this land, they all said the same thing. Chief Joseph said, I accord you the right and I hope that you accord me the right to live in this land. We always were trying to live together. But instead of living together, you all know there was separation, there was segregation. They separated the races, they separated the the Indians, and they separated the blacks. So when they got to the west coast of this land, the elders that were aware of many of these prophecies, when they got to the west coast of this land, they said they would then begin to build a black ribbon. And on this black ribbon, they would move a bug. And when you begin to see this bug moving on the land, that was a sign for the first shaking of the earth. And this first shaking of the earth would be so violent that this bug would be shaken off the earth into the air, and it would begin to move and fly in the air. And by the end of this shaking, this bug would be in the air around the world. And behind it would be a trail of dirt. And eventually, the whole sky of the entire earth would become dirty from these trails of dirt. And this would cause many diseases that would get more and more complicated. So the bug moving on the land, of course, it's easy to see now. In 1908, the Model T Ford was mass produced for the first time. So the elders knew the first shaking of the earth was about to come about. That's the First World War. In the First World War, the airplane came into wide usage for the first time. That was the bug moving into the sky. And so then they knew that something very important would happen. There would be an attempt to make peace on earth on the west coast of this land, and so the elders begin to watch for this. And they begin to hear that there was going to be a League of Nations in San Francisco. So the elders gathered in Arizona around 1920 or so, and they wrote a letter to Woodrow Wilson, and they asked if Indian people could be included in the League of Nations. At that time, the United States Supreme Court had held that a reservation is a separate and semi-sovereign nation, not a part of the United States, but protected by it. And this was of concern because people didn't want the reservations to become more and more separate. They didn't want them to be considered nations. So they did not write back, and the Native people were left out of the League of Nations. So that circle was incomplete. In the League of Nations circle, there was the southern door, the yellow people. There was the western door, the black people. There was the northern door, the white people. 
but the eastern door was not attended and the elders knew that peace would not come on earth until the circle of humanity is complete until all the four pillars set in the circle and share their teachings then peace will come on earth so they knew things would happen things would speed up a little bit there would be a cobweb built around the earth and people would talk across this cobweb when this talking cobweb the telephone was built around the earth a sign of life would appear in the east but it would tilt and bring death it would come with the sun but the sun itself would rise one day not in the east but in the west so the elders said when you see the sun rising in the west and you see the t sign of life reversed and tilted in the east you know that the great death is to come upon the earth and now the great spirit will grab the earth again with his hand and shake it and this shaking will be worse than the first so the sign of life reversed and tilted they called that the swastika and the sun rising in the west was the rising sun of japan these two symbols are carved in stone in arizona when the elders seen these two flags these were the signs that the earth was to be shaken again and the worst misuse of the guardianship of fire is called the gourd of ashes they said a gourd of ashes will fall from the air it will make the people like blades of grass and prairie fire and things will not grow for many seasons the elders tried to contact president roosevelt and ask him not to use the gourd of ashes because it would have great effects upon the earth and eventually cause an even greater destruction in the third shaking of the earth the third world war so they knew that after the second shaking of the earth and they saw the gourd of ashes fall from the sky they knew then they would be trying to make peace on the other side of this land and because the peace attempt on the west coast had failed they would build a special house on the east coast of this turtle island north america and all the nations and the peoples would come to this house and it would be called the house of mica it would shine like the mica on the desert shines so the elders begin to see they were building the united nations made out of glass that reflects like the mica on the desert so they knew that this is the house of mica and all the peoples of the earth should go to it so they met and talked about this they said that in 1920s they had written and they had not been responded to so this time they said we better go to the front door of the house of mica because things might get a lot worse so elders representing a number of tribes i believe drove to new york city when the united nations opened they went to the front door of the house of mica and they said these words we represent the indigenous people of north america and we wish to address the nations of the earth and they said we're going to give you four days to consider whether or not we will be allowed to speak and they retreated to one of the six nations reserves in new york state the six nations reserves are the keepers of the great law of peace of the prophet that appeared here in north america the ganawida and this great law of peace is still recited it takes four days between sunrise and noon each year in indian by memory is recited about this time of year four days later they came back and i believe the nations of the earth they heard that the indians had come to the door and they voted to let the indians in they wanted to hear what they had to say but the united states is one of five nations and the united nations with a veto power and still they were concerned because this time the native sovereignty was even stronger and i believe they vetoed the entrance of the native people so then they knew other things would happen on the earth and the united nations would not bring peace on earth but there would be continuing and deepening confusion and that the little wars would get worse so they retreated to the six nations reserve and they talked about this and they said the time is really getting close now 1949 they said we're going to divide the united states into four sections and each year we're going to have a gathering and we're going to call these the white roots of peace gatherings they begin to have these around 1950 and they authorized certain men to speak in english for the first time about these prophecies one that i used to listen to many times over and over was thomas benyaka he was a hopi he is a hopi man who was authorized to speak in english about what was on the stone tablets 
and he spent his lifetime, has dedicated his lifetime to doing this. And they begin to tell us at these gatherings, they said, in your lifetime you're going to see things happen. It was strange when they said it in the 1950s and 1960s, but now it seems very clear, but then it was unusual. They said you're going to see a time in your life men are going to become women. They said the great spirit, he's going to make a man on the earth. He made him a man, but this man's going to say, I know more than the great spirit, I'm going to change myself to be a woman. And they will even nurse children. They said the great spirit's going to make a woman on this earth. She's going to say, I know more than the great spirit, I want to be a man. And she will be physically a man. This sounded strange. They said you're going to see a time in your lifetime, the human beings are going to find the blueprint that makes us. They're going to find the blueprint that makes us. They call that now DNA, dionucleic acid. And they said they're going to cut this blueprint. They call that now genetic splicing. And they said they're going to make new animals upon the earth. And they're going to think these are going to help us. And it's going to seem like they do help us. But maybe the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they're going to suffer. I don't know if you heard on the news last month in the United States now, they have genetically spliced a new germ never before released in the environment. They want to release this germ into the cotton fields of the South to, they say it will rejuvenate and strengthen the cotton. They had scientists on the CBS Evening News the other night talking about it, and one scientist, he said what the elder said in 1950, he says, this will not harm us, we put it in a lot of tests. And the other scientist, he said what the other elders, he said what the elders also said, he said no, this has never before been in the environment. We have no idea what it would do. But the elders spoke of it long ago. They said it would seem harmless, but it may be it will hurt the great-grandchildren. The elders said long ago, they will release these things. They will use them. This is going to be released not too long from now. They are making new animals. The elders talked about this. They said, you will see new animals, and even the old animals will come back. Animals that people thought had disappeared, they will find them here and there. They begin to reappear. They said, you will see a time, about this time, they said, that there's going to be a time when the eagle will fly its highest in the night and it will land upon the moon. Some tribes say the eagle will circle the moon. Some tribes say the eagle will fly its highest in the night. And at that time, they say, many of the native people will be sleeping which symbolically means they have lost their teachings. Or some tribes say it would be as if they're frozen, they've been through the long winter. But they say when the eagle flies its highest in the night, that will be the first light of a new day. That will be the first thawing of spring. Of course, at the first light of a new day, if you stayed up all night, you notice it's really dark. And the first light, you want to see it, but you can't. It sneaks up on you. You want to see it change, but it was dark, and then pretty soon it's getting light before you know it. We're at that time now. The eagle has landed on the moon, 1969. When that spaceship landed, they sent back the message, the eagle has landed. Traditional Navy people from, the, from clear up in the Inuit that had shared with us they had this prophecy, clear down to the Quechua's in South America who shared with us they had this prophecy. I'm sitting in Quechua village at the moment, um, and there is there is a, a a prophecy of the eagle and the condor also. Um, this suggests that the people in the United States that have this kind of uh, certain type of mentality uh, will come to South America, and um, and they'll bring that back with them and. Uh, I would say that's happening with the the, the increase in the um, interest in, in ayahuasca and other plant medicines. And then also I wanted to mention that uh, I had an, a Navajo friend, a uh, Diné friend named Blackfoot. We were talking about uh, the Diné language, and um, it's 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 nearly impossible to make the sounds um, unless you're Diné. Uh, but I was interested in the language, and I said, well, what do you do about you know cars and airplanes and stuff and and did you make new words or do you just use the english and he said no neither we just will say uh th if the 
car needs gas, the metal horse needs to drink. And so, you know, a lot of people have in the past uh, sort of scoffed at these Native American prophecies saying that, you know, they're talking about eagles and, and the bug, the Model T Ford, the bug crawling along the highway and then the bug flies. And um, the reality is, I think, that even if these natives had seen literal cars, airplanes, and space shuttles landing on the moon, they still would have used um, language that was available to them uh, to describe those things. So it's just an interesting note to make. When they heard those first words, the ego has landed. They knew that was the start of a new time and a new power for native people. There is absolutely nothing strong before us now. We may do anything we wish. In 1776, when the United States government printed the dollar in one claw, if you've ever noticed, there's an olive branch in this claw. They said that represented peace. The Indian elders shared with me in South Dakota what the them that represents the enslavement of black people. In the prophecies of the Six Nations people, they say there will be two great uprisings by black people to free themselves. We've seen one about 1964. There will be a second, more violent one to come. In the other claw is 13 arrows. The founding fathers of the United States said that represents the 13 states. But they say the elders, that represents the enslavement of native people. When the eagle landed on the moon, they decided to print a special silver dollar to commemorate that. I don't know how many of you noticed it. The original design showed the spaceship landing on the moon, but at the last minute it was changed to an actual eagle. And in the eagle's claws is the olive branch, but the arrows are gone. And the elders said, that's our prophecy. We have been released. There was one more uprising coming for the black race of people, and then they will be released. And this is also going to have an effect on needy people, a good effect. But we're in that time now. We're between the first light of a new day and the sunrise. The sunrise is about to come. When it comes up, everyone is going to see it. But you know how it is in the village. There's a few people that get up early, and there's some that sleep till noon. And he said, when that eagle lands on the moon, the powers will begin to come back to us. And you know, as an alcoholic person, I feel that one of our greatest diseases is alcoholism. And within seven days of the time the eagle landed on the moon, the first native alcoholism program was started on an Apache reservation in Arizona. Within seven days of the time the eagle landed on the moon, the Freedom of Indian Religion Act was introduced into the United States Congress. In 1978, it was signed by President Carter, I believe it was November 10th. It was punishable at one time to go to jail for 10 years and or a $10,000 fine for singing a song or doing a sweat. This was changed in 1978. The legislation was introduced in 1969, less than seven days after the eagle landed on the moon. These are the physical manifestations of the spiritual prophecies that we have. So they said at this time you're going to see things will speed up. The people on the earth will move faster and faster. Grandchildren will not have time for grandparents. Parents will not have time for children. It will seem like time is going faster and faster, and the elders advised us, as things speed up, you yourself should slow down. The faster things go, the slower you go. Because there's going to come a time when the earth is going to be shaken a third time. The Great Spirit has been shaking the earth two times, the First and Second World Wars, to remind us that we are a human family, to remind us that we should have greeted each other as brothers and sisters. We had a chance after each shaking to come together in a circle that would have brought peace on earth. But we missed that. Last night they were talking on the news about the sign for the third shaking of the earth. I heard it sitting in the airport after I missed my plane. They said they're going to build what the elders called the house in the sky. In the 1950s they talked about this. They will build a house and throw it into the sky. When you see people living in the sky on a permanent basis, you will know the Great Spirit is about to grab the earth. This time not with one hand, but with both hands. Many of you of native background may have heard the spirits will warn you twice, but the third time you stand alone. We've had two warnings, the first two world wars, but now we stand alone in the third one. 
as it says in the Baha'i writings, there will be no one protected. When this house is in the sky, the great spirit's going to shake the earth a third time, and whoever dropped that gourd of ashes upon them is going to drop. They say at that time there will be villages in this land so great that when you stand in these villages, you will not be able to see out. And in the prophecies, these were called villages of stone, or prairies of, prairies of stone. And they said the stone will grow up from the ground and you will not be able to see beyond the village. And at the center of each and every one of these villages, there will be native people, and they will walk as hollow shells upon a prairie of stone. They said hollow shells, this means they will have lost many of their traditional understandings. They will be empty within. They said after the eagle lands on the moon, some of these people will begin to leave these prairies of stone and come home and take up some of the old ways and begin to make themselves reborn because it's a new day. But many will not. And they said there's going to come a time when in the morning the sun is going to rise and those villages of stone will be there. And in the evening there will just be steam coming from the ground. It will be as steam. And in the center of many of those villages of stone, when they turn to steam, the native people will turn to steam also because they never woke up and left the village. And this used to bother me when I was a young man. I used to ask the elders, is it there anything we can do? And they said, well, it's just that way that if the person does not have the spiritual eyes to see, it's very hard to show them. Or if they don't have the ears to hear, it's very hard to speak with them. We wish that we could go get them all, but we can't. It's just that some are not going to wake up. But some will wake up. And so they say there's going to be the third shaking of the earth. It's going to be not a good thing to see, but we will survive it. We will survive it. And when we survive it, then there's going to be another attempt to make a circle of the human beings on the earth. And this time the native people will not have to petition to join, but will be invited to enter the circle because they say the attitude towards us will have changed by then. And people will invite us into the circle, and all the four colors of the four directions will share their wisdoms, and there will be a peace on earth. This is coming close. All times when I share this message of the prophecies, people say, can't we change it? Could we stop it? The answer is yes. The prophecies are always either or. We could have came together way back there in 1565, and we could have had a great civilization, but we didn't. Always along the path of these prophecies, we could have came together. We still could. If we could stop racial and religious disharmony, we would not have to go through this third shaking. The elders say the chance of that is pretty slim. It seems to me like it's pretty slim, too. But they say what we can do is we can cushion it. The word they, we use is cushion. We can cushion it. So it won't be quite as bad. How do we do this? We do this by sharing the teaching that will reunite us. The Hopis and the prophecies say there will be a religion that comes here. Maybe it will be true and bring unity, or maybe it will not bring unity. If it does not bring unity, a second religion will come. And the people of this religion are known in the Hopi language as the Baha'ni, the people of Baha. Ni means people of. So I was looking for the people of Baha. I wondered who the people of Baha were. Baha, it means light and glory. Baha'i means followers of the light, or the people of Baha. Uh, you know, this uh, message of the Hermetic tradition, um, I've been talking about it for 15 years now, um, that consciousness is generated by the light, uh, that stars are conscious beings, um, because it's light that is consciousness, and the density of light where there are stars is enormous and so there's tremendous focal point of, of consciousness where there's a star we know the name of our star it's Ra the Egyptians knew this and it's the reemergence of an awareness of the basic 
metaphysical truth of the universe that the the true spiritual underpinnings of the universe are no different than observing this deck that I'm sitting on and the jungle around me. It is what is there. And the truth is self-substantiating. The truth is fundamentally light. Matter is light in a standing wave. And it is light that gives life. It is light that, that gives us our consciousness and therefore our spirit and our soul. And I was noticing today that there's a huge resurgence of um, these these mystery tradition revelations uh, that have come to us at various points over the centuries. Um, and so uh, it's it's remarkable to hear that that you know uh, these followers of the light are are the ones that the Hopi have prophesied uh, to come after this great shaking and rebuild uh, civilization because that's precisely what I think a lot of us um, are are expecting that may not be aware of these Hopi prophecies. We've been waiting for these people a long time. They say they will bring a teaching that will unite the earth. So we need to share this teaching. They say the fire will come from the north. So here we are in the circle in the north, talking about the Bahanis, the people of Bahan, the teachings of Baha'u'llah. When I heard about these, none of them made any sense. But now it has, most of it has come to pass. Last night on the news, they said the house in the sky will be put up in 1996. The earth as we know it is going to change. Each of us carry, I believe, a sacred drop of light. In the Indian teachings, they say it takes nine ancestors to agree before conception can occur. Nine ancestors of the husband and the wife have to come together in the spiritual realm and say, we will bring life before a person woman can become pregnant. At that time, the soul is formed. I delivered my first daughter, and I, a man who, from the blood reserve who went to South Dakota and was the first blood to pierce for her. In 82 years, he came to my house by coincidence four days before my wife went into labor. Each night, we had a ceremony. And after the morning of, on the morning after the fourth ceremony, my wife went into labor at sunrise. And that night at sunset, the daughter was born. And I took her out and I cut the cord, you know, and I noticed that at the Sundance that the Lakota people do in South Dakota, they pass that pipe three times and they don't take it in the fourth time. And even in Washington, I've heard the coming of a child is like the coming of a new pipe. And when I was delivering my daughter, I happened to notice that the skull came out three times. And on the fourth time, her head came out like the coming of a pipe. So I took her out and I cleaned her up and I washed her and I, I first I put her on the mother instantly. But then after a few minutes, I rewashed her up. There was a circle of people just about like this around my wife and Fernie and people with different backgrounds. And we looked up and through the ceiling came a small drop of blue light. When it got close to the child, you could not see it. That was her soul. She would carry that light throughout earth. In that is her special uniqueness as a being, her spiritual power. In that are her gifts. After we go through, and then we carry it back here, and it radiates to the mind, but for some reason in this cycle, we've been in the lower natures, the animal part. But now we're going into the human world, and the mind is going to be opened up to the radiance of that, our own soul and the cycle of the human beings is going to come about. And something so good is going to happen on this earth that cannot even be described. The elders say it in different ways. They say something like this. They say, there will be grass at that time when they make that circle and bring the peace on the earth. There will be blades of grass that have not quite come through the earth. They, even they will try to push themselves up to be part of that day when the sun rises. They say out here outside this building, long, long before there was a fairgrounds here, there were native people. They say many of these native people in different tribes, they were aware of these things, and they told their children. Their children grew up. You know, one time the people came from the Hopis, the scientists came to the Hopis, and they said, we want to take a piece of the stone tablets. Well, they said, we want to take the stone tablets to a scientific laboratory to determine how old they are. The Hopi said, we know how old they are. <laughs> well, the scientist says, we want to confirm it. 
Well, the Hopis let them take a little piece, and they did that, the carbon dating method. They found these tablets were at least 10,000 years old, maybe 50. So when I say thousands of years ago, there were native people that spoke of these things. That's exactly what I mean. They told their children. And thousands of years ago, their children grew up and told their children. And then their children grew up and told their children. And they spoke about the people that will live at this time, and now it is us. We are the ones they spoke of long ago. They say to be allowed to become into creation and live upon the earth at this time is a great honor. In the cycle of time, from the beginning to the end, this time that we're in now, the change, the purification of all things, they say this is the hardest time to live, but it's also the greatest honor to be allowed to live and see this. In the state of Washington in 1855, they signed treaties and made 22 Indian reservations. They wanted to do it before there was problems. They thought they were advanced at the time. They had learned from what had happened elsewhere. They made 22 Indian reservations and the elders spoke in 1855 and they said, we're going to become weaker and you're going to become stronger. And if you wish to break these treaties, you may do so. They said, that, but there's going to come a time when the earth itself will rise up and purify itself. And this will be announced. It will be announced by the speaking of one of 16 great ones on the west coast of this land. One of first of the 16 great ones speaks, the purification will have begun. It was a little over five years ago when Mount St. Helens, one of the 16 great volcanoes on the west coast of this land, spoke. The Seattle Times did a special interest story. They went over to Watson Totus and Woodrow Bill. They asked Watson Totus and Woodrow Bill as spiritual people of the Yakima Nation, what does this mean? What they said was so profound that they didn't put it on page 16, they put it on the front page of the Seattle Times. They said this means that the races and nations of the earth should slow down and come together and talk to each other. That's exactly what it meant. I just want to uh, point out for anybody that missed it, I, I think this talk was given in 1995. He was talking about how one of the indications that World War III is upon us is going to be that there are transgendered people running around everywhere. Um, now, mind you, that's not anything negative about transgendered people, except he said, you know, that maybe it's a little arrogant that these people think that they know more than great spirit and, you know, that they weren't born right the first time. <laughs> maybe an insult to great spirit. Um, but it's just an indicator uh, that this this great purification is coming. And, you know, of course, that's not the only um, remarkable thing in this talk. But the fact that it was given in 1995 and all of these circumstances, uh, has, it has done nothing but clarify um, these prophecies and to uh, validate them. And we had four years and four days to do that. Four years and four days later, Mount St. Helens went off the second time. That was last spring, just about this time. That was our grace period. We could have still done something really good, but now things are going to speed up. Now things are going to really happen fast. Time is going to go so fast. The more we share the message, the more we will cushion the third shaking of the earth, and the easier it will be on ourselves and others. A good friend of mine in Montana, his grandmother just passed away last year. The last thing she said to him was make a place for yourself in the mountains because the air would become so hot down here where they were at on the reservation that it would be hard to breathe. And it won't be long. It's the last thing she told her grandson when she was passing. Go on the mountains and make a place for yourself. Put some things there that you can survive with. The people are going to run to the mountains to survive, and the native people must be ready for this. And they're going to turn to native people, and they're going to turn to the local spiritual assemblies. So this is that time. We are now within the purification of all things. Non-natives call this the apocalypse. The native elders call this the purification. 
I want to share one non-native prophecy with you. There was a prophet, or a seer, not a prophet, but a seer in Europe, his name was Nostradamus. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He foresaw three great shakings of the earth. He said the third shaking would begin when Lesser Arabia and Persia engaged in a war. Five years ago, when Mount St. Helens went off, Iraq attacked Iran. Lesser Arabia today is called Iraq. Persia is called Iran. These two prophecies coincide. Both the native elders and Nostradamus said this would start slowly, almost unnoticed by the peoples of the earth, but it would eventually involve us all. Eventually the doors of ashes will fall from the sky so much that the river that runs through the center of this turtle island, the Mississippi River, will boil from the heat of the gourds of ashes that will fall on this land. But don't despair, it sounds terrible, but we, we will survive it. We will live through it. So, in closing, I would like to call on each and every person, regardless of who you are, young or old, native or non-native, to arise now and to awake, to embrace this time, to learn everything you can about the teachings and the writings, to arise and awake and go forth, all the peoples of the earth. You're going to find them. Peoples everywhere are now receptive to the message. It is time to arise and awake and go forth and teach. There's people out there waiting to hear. Waiting to hear. All right. Well, I hope we had um, audio this time. Yeah, wow. That, that was like the most, one of the most incredible things I ever heard in my life. 1995. Um, clearly these prophecies are real and true and correct. Um, do me a favor to you guys, hit the like button, share these videos, especially this video, man. I'm going to edit it so that we have one that has good audio all the way through and I'll repost it. So when I repost that, um, you know, I really encourage you guys to share that. It helps me out, but also just to show people, you know, that consciousness is not what materialist science has told us that it is. In fact, materialist science hasn't even really claimed to know what it is. Uh, it's considered the hard problem of neuroscience because no one can really say what it is. We know that people have been born without brains that are doctors. They have no brain. Um, things are not as they thought. And so consciousness is a unified field that is not restrained by the strictures of time and space and is just an interpenetrated field uh that is inextricably intertwined with all of, of space uh it, it is possible to know things that are coming in the future and even if you want to uh, be less mystical about it you could say that um the the subconscious mind can map out patterns and extend those patterns into the future and that is how these type of predictions are made but i think that 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 was an extraordinary um, speech that that man gave. Uh, I have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, so I'm not going to go on um, talking too much about this. I think that all spoke for itself. Um, really just absolutely mind-blowing and humbling. And I think that, you know, if you weren't taking the reality that we're on the cusp of a major transition seriously after watching that video, uh, yeah, I hope you are. Um, because that was 1995. Putin wasn't threatening nukes in 1995. You know, he mentioned that all the men will be becoming women. Aleister Crowley also wrote that in the introduction to the Book of the Law about how when we were on the verge of really moving into the new aeon, that people would become more uh, epicen, and bisexual. Epicen means that they are of an indeterminate sex. Um, so we have these prophecies coming from multiple cultures, you know, and we also have uh, indications that this knowledge, that this interaction of consciousness with light, uh, it has really, ex it, it has arisen in cultures all over the planet. Uh, we have Hopi that had secret handshakes uh, that they would attempt to, and that's how, you know, in, in the Western mystery schools, the step and grip, um, these secret handshakes that we use to identify other initiates in every mystery school, not just the Freemasons. Um, this is... This is an extraordinary thing um, that 
uh, man had the truth, it seems, in antiquity, and wandering long in the darkness, he's lost the truth and found error. Um, but through calamity and trial and tribulation, uh, he will be forged by fire, and he will once again uh, reconcile with the truth. And once we are walking in the light of truth, we will be liberated um, from the, the shadows of history. The great revolution prepared for, prepared by the ages, uh, will truly begin to march, and it has for its aims the amelioration of mankind from servitude, from ignorance, from slavery, from war. We have wandered long in the darkness, and it is into the light that we shall emerge, uh, just as this Hopi man said that, you know, one of the prophecies was that these these followers of the light, that these people who hold light sacred. This is just the rediscovery of what was known to the initiates of the Egyptian mystery schools. Um, it's obvious to anyone uh, who is able to, to strip away their indoctrination from their religion and their culture and to look at the universe with honest, uh, clear, unfettered uh, eyes, with the, the mind free from its manacles and the perception liberated then the truth is everywhere. It is in everything, and it is readily apparent. And so uh, from chaos emerges order, and that new emergent order is upon us. So I would encourage everyone to have confidence and faith and to find strength and courage uh, and to commit um, to your true purpose because, you know, as eternal beings, we don't have to worry about being blown apart by nuclear fission um, because we will just come together again in some other place in some other time, and we will be as we were before, only greater, because through every cycle, uh, the universe is made more and more perfect, and we are microcosms of the macrocosm of the universe. And so whatever is happening to the universe at large is happening to us. We reflect all of these processes, and um, moving towards uh, a greater level of, of, of harmony and peace, is um, something that is hardwired into the structure of the universe as an ultimate outcome. Uh, all, all systems uh, move towards homeostasis. And so, um, you know, I, I wish I had more time to talk about all this. I, I just have to get up so early, and I, I'm so excited about this. I found this randomly today, honestly. Um, I, I just... Uh, I had just noticed that there were a whole bunch of there was a whole bunch of new content re regarding uh, this this knowledge of light and the Hermetic Mystery Schools and the Kabbalion and all of this stuff. Really big names, big influencers on YouTube and Instagram and stuff suddenly talking about all this stuff. And those are the Baha that this guy um, was was talking about that that the Hopi prophesied. Um, and I, I was thinking about how it really seems like that's gathering steam. And then, you know, I wasn't expecting that um, at the end of this this talk. Uh, it's really extraordinary stuff. So I want to thank all you guys for spending this time with me. Please, when I get this edited, come back to the channel, subscribe to the channel, and share it everywhere. Because I think this is probably the most convincing thing that I have ever seen um, in terms of really uh, almost proving uh, the point that needs to be made to everyone on earth that doesn't know it already. Um, so, you know, and I also need support. Uh, we're demonetized. The algorithm buries me. So if you appreciate what I'm doing, please like the videos, share the videos, subscribe to the channel. Uh, you can support us through PayPal, Zelle, um, and uh, other methods uh, that's in the description, um, which I'll actually put in the chat right now. Um, and we do need support, you know, tomorrow I'm going to, to, to keto five o'clock in the morning because I have to go get our camera fixed and so it could cost hundreds of dollars and I only use that camera for this channel. So, um, you know, it's, 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 this is all coming out of my pocket to, to try to get this message out of here. So we really do appreciate your support. Uh, and we'll see you guys again very, very soon. Thank you so much for watching. We still have one room open in the retreat. If you guys are interested in i know it's not a lot of notice uh we're ending at the end of october um but if you're interested in plant medicine and uh hermetic ritual magic 
and just consciousness in general. Um, it's uh, it's going to be a lot. We are going to continue at another property, but the overhead is so much higher that, that this is really the last uh, round that it's going to be really, really affordable, um, which was really important to me. And I we really, really made it uh, affordable this time around, but that won't be the case um, after... Uh, after this last few weeks of October. So thank you guys and good night.